one year of the record keeper coming out. And I know that, I think basically the day the book came out, you read it, you plowed through it, and you then sent Agnes a message on Twitter because you loved it so much. So in case you don't remember her, your message, I have it here. <laughs> as a black man, as a father, as a human, I deeply appreciated your book. So why did this book move you to send her that message? Well, I think I can answer that by saying not only I can tell you why it moved me then, but I can tell you why, why me being moved by that book is even more relevant right now. As, as a kid, as a black kid growing up in Tangelo Park um, in the 70s and the 80s, we weren't taught to dream or that certain things, even in sci-fi, could be our spaces as well. Those are uh, thought of tra traditionally as white spaces um, or spaces of the majority. Why would a black man be in space? You know, it was, it was so, so huge that we had, we had um, Nichelle Nichols on, on Star, Star Trek, and that was historic. But for, for the most part, sci-fi didn't have any place for black people. Being a superhero, you, it, no places for us. We had like Black Falcon and Black Lightning who were relegated to, to sidekicks, basically, or Luke Cage, all overpowered and oversexed and, and a hyper-masculine version of something. So, so to me, growing up, loving sci-fi fantasy, being able to read a book written by someone who looks like me, who comes from a place like me, who thinks like me, and creates this world and shows that, yes, in, in a post-apocalyptic future, guess what? There can be black people. There, there can be a protagonist of, of color. It touched me so much because it's not only good for me as that little kid reading books that he, he wasn't represented in, but for my daughter and for my grandkids. That's, that's why I was moved to reach out to her. And that's why even now, a year later, I love Agnes even more so. We've become friends and her vision. And it just makes me so proud of her. And you talked about becoming friends. You know, I get to witness the first time you guys met face to face. You had talked. The first time you met face to face was on yeah. stage at your show in Orlando, Wayne Brady. Yes. Was. What was that moment where you realized that it was her? Because I remember you asking her name. You were asking all the people on stage her name, and I remember, and you were like, "Oh, and we have it on video, which is super cool." But what was that moment when you realized, like, "Oh, this is the person that I've connected with, that I've been talking to, and now she's here with me on stage in my hometown." I think it was like meeting a long lost family member. It truly was. And uh, th there was a sense of connection there that uh, I just can't describe. When, when you find a, a like mind, a kindred spirit, you, you immediately know. And uh, that was a great night. And you talk about being a, a young boy growing up in Tangelo Park and not seeing yourself represented. She said to me that she views Afrofuturism futurism as a tool of emancipation and that she wants young black children to know that they can dream bigger than themselves and that they can use it to see something bigger than what they're physically seeing. Absolutely. Afrofuturism, just like I, I said, said being a kid and, and not even being able to picture black people in space. Yeah, dream big. We, little chocolate and brown kids of all uh, ethnicities should be able to picture a world where they could, where they could go to the stars, where maybe they could develop superpowers, where maybe they could, because those fantasies bleed into real life. If you can imagine those things and see a world like that, then you can imagine being a politician. Then you can imagine being a scientist that can help create something. You, you can imagine um, go, uh, working at, at JPL. You can imagine working at NASA. You can imagine these things that we are told by the outside. And then because of that, we tell ourselves on the inside, inside our community sometimes, you can't do that. That's not for us. Afrofuturism says not only is that for us, but it's all for us. And in the book, Erica, the heroine, she really, as she confronts how everything she's been taught is wrong, so she's able to help free her people, 
How do you think that relates to what's going on now? I know so many people are realizing that like a lot of what we learn in school and history is not really accurate. Like I'm taking a class right now called the great unlearn where I'm like unlearning like all the whitewashed history. How do you think that relates to what's going on in our world right now? Oh, I think it's so pertinent because you know, to use the old, uh, the, the old NBC thing, sorry, CBS, <laughs> of, uh, of uh, the more you know, mm-hmm. it's true, right? And G.I. Joe, Joe even said, and knowing's half the battle. If you know, you are empowered. If you are empowered, you can make moves. You are not left in a place of ignorance and you're not left idle. Mm-hmm. So if America doesn't, we are very fond And I say this as a proud American whose family has been in the military for generations. If we want to truly claim the mantle of the greatest country on on earth, we have to be truthful with ourselves. Just like if I want to say, well, 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 I want to be the best dude on TV, that I've got to be truthful with myself about my strengths and about my past so, so I can learn and go, go on. We have so much history that we have just swept right under this collective rug and then gone, nope, it's cool. Let's move forward. Thing, if things are great. No, because we just repeat the mistakes of our fathers. If we don't know uh, about Black Wall Street in Tulsa, if we don't know about Rosewood, if we don't know about the amazing um, works of certain black authors and, <clears throat> and, and, and inventors and and the contributions that, that, that have been made to the fabric of this country, then we don't know anything. If we don't know about things, things that, that have happened, things, things that my daughter had to teach me about when, when the railroads were being built and Chinese immigrants were brought over to build the, the crimes that happened there, the, the, the things, things that, that have happened in our history. If we don't acknowledge them, then we can't move forward. It's not damning anyone. It's just saying, hey, this is what is real. It, it, it doesn't start at Columbus sailed the ocean blue, and then all of a sudden, we've got New York. Mm-mm, no, it, no, 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 it doesn't work, work like that. And, and it doesn't begin at Thanksgiving and, and the pilgrims and, and uh, you know, with MTV. There, there's a whole lot that we need to teach each other. And you mentioned teaching each other. Why is that so important right now that we have these open conversations and these conversations that aren't necessarily easy? Because we have to be uncomfortable. We, and, and, I, and I say we, and really what I mean is even for the non-black allies, I think we as friends, as people, we need to be a little, little uncomfortable because I have plen- plenty of friends who don't know things. Not that they have ever treated me badly or they walk in the world badly, but just because of lack of knowing things, sometimes they may say something that is part of an inherited, inherent bias. And then you've got to go, whoa, let me educate you on this. But also, you know, to quote a uh, Dr. Phillips grad, um, Amanda Seals, you know, who is out there killing it right now as an advocate, it's also not every black person's job to teach that's that's the thing is we is i don't feel like being being uh you know the mystical brother in a um in a movie where i come out and go let me give you all the knowledge brother it's all in this book if you want to learn if you want to learn about your country and if you want to be an ally and you want to be on the side of love then arm yourself with knowledge like you're doing you decided to go to, to a class. I think we all need to learn. We all need to learn and we can do it on our own. It's not saying, saying that I don't want to have conversations because I love to and I want to, pre- to uh, teach, but don't expect your black friend to teach you. Go out and learn, learn as well because I think you will be learning as, as an American. You will be learning as a human we, it's not our job to teach, but if you want to know something, I'll be glad to share something if I know it, because I also think, think that it's, it's incumbent on me to learn because I, I can't go out and, and teach you about my history and my past 
if that in, information has been hidden from me as well. A lot of stuff has not been taught to my generation of, of black kids and, and the generations after. So we have to learn as well, so we're armed. So if we all learn, then we all can have a conversation and then things can change because then, then the minority becomes the ignorant. Then, then those guys that are deeply entrenched in what they want, like this one uh, NASCAR driver who says that he's going to quit being a NASCAR driver because of the ban on the, uh, on the Confederate flag, that's cool. You stay right there in your little pocket of ignorance. You enjoy that. We are going to go on and learn. Uh, shout, shout out to uh, Lady Antebellum, the band that, that changed, changed her name to Lady A. Why? Because they learned that antebellum, of course, means, means before the war. And why, while they thought that it just brought to mind prosaic images of the South, no, before the war, slavery, those images, they, they said, now that we know that, let's switch it up. Thank God for, for people like that. Yeah. Why do you think that it's important for people to read this book, especially now? I just feel like when Agnes and I were talking about reviving the story and bringing it back and airing it, I'm like it's so important now for people to see stories like this and read stories like this, I feel. Reading a story where, where I think just even on the surface, where the protagonist may not look like you or share your your uh, your point of view is very important because it's a practice in empathy. It's it's empathy. It's it's empathy through fiction. Um, also, getting a chance to to look at a world where where they talk about racism and they talk about how the remaining country is structured so that the black people are doing this work and and Latin people are doing this work and learning. Sometimes it's easier for people to learn about social constructs through fiction instead of having it pushed in their face in the news. So I think it's very important to read this just as a work of art, but it's also important to read this as a work of art that, that basically teaches you how things were slash are, but through, through, through such a great uh, world, world building tool. Yeah. She was saying that she, her goal was to teach some really ugly history in a way that's palatable, that you enjoy it, but you're like, oh, did that happen? And then you're on Google and you're like, oh gosh, that did happen. Yes, it makes you think. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and a lot, of us, a lot of us don't like to do that these days. All right, I'm trying to think what else we need to touch on. Okay, you, you guys are still working together. Are you working together on anything you can share? <laughs> well, we're working together on things have slowed slowed down now, but I'm still trying to get the record keeper made into either a feature or or into a TV series. That's an active thing, and we talk. We we don't talk as much as we used to. Right up until the pandemic, I feel we were talking every every couple of days, and then life got in the way. But we still check in with each other, and she throws me ideas, and I throw her some. So the so the so the plan is still to come up with a world. Where, where we can tell certain stories. And that's the part that I'm very excited about. Yeah, we're excited about that too. My daughter wants to know if you'll be in the movie or the, the Netflix series or whatever you're doing. Man. That's her question today when I told her what I was doing. Is he starring in it? And I'm like, I, I, well, he can't star in it because he's not a teenage girl. Right. <laughs> if, I, if I help get this thing made, you bet, you bet that I will be in there in some way, shape, form, or fashion. If you need a dystopian reporter, I know there's not one in there, <laughs> but if you need making, a reporter, making a production note right now, yes, just call me. That's I, um, I was in an own TV series as a reporter. I can only play a reporter. <laughs> I'm trying to think what else I'm going to ask you. Anything that I didn't ask you that you're like, why the heck didn't you ask me this? This is important or anything you want us to know. Anything at all? I, um, I think I also would love to, to give props to Agnes for writing a strong black young heroine, which, which I think is also very, um, very aspirational that, that uh, we need to see young women of color being able to do these amazing things and be just as strong, you know, as, uh, as, as literature is, is is littered with with stories of plucky young female spunky white heroes that that get it done and uh, with a can can do spirit so uh, 
So I'm glad, glad that we, we have a hero, a hero like Erica. Yeah, it's an incredible book. book. I'm so glad you recommended it to me. It was good plain reading, as we said it would be. Okay, I think that that should do it. I know you've got another call. Are you, I see you singing on Instagram, mentioning a show when you were singing your song that you mentioned Brianna Taylor. Are you touring again when world, the world is normal? Well, who, who knows what that, that yeah. will look like. What we're doing right now is we're getting ready to do, I think in the next couple of weeks through, uh, through one of these streaming platforms, we're gonna, I'm going to be doing a, a, uh, either an at home or at a small studio, a musical comedy special, probably get Jonathan, you know, we'll do some socially distanced comedy. And, uh, but, but I can set up, you know, the cameras even here at my house or in my studio and, and get a chance to, to do a live improv thing. So we're working on that. So I'll let you know, know when that happens. Yes, please do. I mean, come back to Orlando. I assume you didn't make it back for your grandmother's birthday. Wasn't that like the pandemic? Yeah, we couldn't get on a plane. Yeah. I, I absolutely couldn't. And I want to protect her. So I don't need to go, go and get, a, get on a plane. And she just turned 89. So, so I'm not going to, you know, hurt, hurt that old lady. She means <laughs> too much to me. Thank you, my dear. All right. Bye. Have a great All right.